we pick up from chapter 35. You know, I mentioned um, last time when we were going over chapter 34, I mentioned that, you know, I emphasized that Jacob's life, right, was going uphill. Then at some point, he actually, he tops up and then he started to go down, right? And that incident was at the... Um, when you look at chapter 30, end of chapter 32, where he actually wrestled with Angel. And that is really important uh, incident that will continue to uh, give us a clue about his life and how his life changed from where he was and how his life is turning into something completely different. So starting 34, <clears throat> you know, we have seen his daughter, one and only daughter, was raped by uh, Shechem, uh, the sons. And then right after that, his two of his sons, which was uh, uh, the uh, Smeon and uh, Levi, went out and killed all those people and brought all the plunders. So, first of all, his one and only daughter was raped, and two, two of his sons became a killer, and he, they did something wrong to the people. And then, as he was living there, now he's afraid that the people in that town may actually revenge and then kill his family, so he was living in fear as well. So as you look at the chapter 34 uh, and on, remember his name is Jacob. Jacob means like grabbing things. Once he grabs, he will never let it go. You know, anything that he can get, he will just grab it until he get it. So like, you know, he's very determined and he's always have a plan. And once he decides that I want this and he will get it one way or another. So he's the kind of person who always try to take things in for whatever he wishes. But after that incident, uh, after he wrestled with the angels at uh, Paniel, now when you look at chapter 34 and on, all you see is God is taking away from that what he had. So he accumulated so much that he loved it so much and he kept it. Once he grabs it, he will never let it go. So he kept it all. But now, one at a time, God is taking away from him that he loved, that he actually cared for. So he's taking daughters away. He's taking two sons away. And we'll continue to look at how God is taking things away from him. So chapter 35, <clears throat> Then God said to Jacob, Go up to Bethel and settle there, and build an altar there to God, who appeared to you when you were fleeing from your brother Esau. Just remember what God is saying to Jacob. Okay? Where is Jacob living right now? Where do they settle? Where did they settle? When you go back to chapter 33 at the end, verse 17, <coughs> he said, Jacob, however, went to Sukkot. Right? And then where he built a place for himself and made shelter for his livestock. That is why the place is called Sukkot. And that's we that's where he settled after he came back from Padan Aram. Now, let's go back to why he came back to this place. What was the reason that he came back? What drove him to come to this place?
Well, the thing is, why did he come from Padan Aram? What drove him to come to this place? Why did he leave his uncle to come to this place? So when you go back, <clears throat> chapter 30, 31. Verse 3, it said, Then the Lord said to Jacob, Go back to the land of your fathers and to your relatives, and I will be with you. Right? So that was the reason why he left that place. Because God told him to go back. Right? And then, before that time, and after that, he said the certain things in verse 13 on the same chapter. Verse 13, you, when you look at it, I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed a pillar and where you made a vow to me. Now leave this land at once and go back to your native land. I don't know if you remember the, the explanation that I gave that until this point, God never mentioned him as God of Bethel. This is first time ever he said, I am the God of Bethel. So why is he emphasizing that he is the God of Bethel? Why is God emphasizing him as himself as God of Bethel? <coughs> exactly. That's where he made the vow, and that's where God made the promise that I will bring you back. So when we go back, a little uh, further, chapter 28. <coughs> so when he was a fleeing from his brother Esau, when he was a sleeping, he saw the angels go, you know, going up and down in, a, uh, in the stairway. And then he said, <coughs> verse 15, I am with you and will watch over you where you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. So that's where God made a promise to Jacob. And then Jacob said to uh, Jacob named that place as Bethel in verse 19. So he said, he called that place Bethel, though the city used to be called Luz. And then he made the vow to God and said, if you protect me, if you get me the clothes, if you bring me back to my father's land again, you'll, you'll, be, my, you'll be my God. And he also said, if you do that, this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you gave me, I will give you a tenth. So he made the vow as well. Not only God made a promise to Jacob, said, I will bring you back to this land. And he also made a vow to God and said, if you do this, 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 then you'll be my God and I'll, you know, I will you know, uh, make this stone as your house, and I'm going to give a tenth of everything you gave me. So God said, and 20 years later, he reminded him, I want you to go back. So when he says go back, where is he saying to go back? Where is he directing him to go? No, Padan Aram is where he is, where Jacob used to be. Correct. He's ascending him back to Bethel. Right? But when you look at chapter 30, uh, uh, 33, at the end, where did he settle? Sukkot is where he settled. Right? He didn't go to Bethel. The Sukkot 
is not far away from Bethel. So then, soon as he settled there, imagine, right before that, after he met Esau, Jacob said to his brother, I said, why don't you go on your way and I will follow you and I will meet you there, which is where Esau leaves, where is uh, the place where, the, where Esau le- uh, used to, li- uh, not used to, where he lives is uh, Sail. But he didn't go there. Although he said, I will follow you and I will see you there, he didn't go there. And rather, he went to Sukkot and that's where he settled. That's not the land that God told him to go. But he made himself, you know, this place home. He bought the land and he settled there. He, you know, uh, he decided to just stay there. But as soon as he decided to settle there, what happened was his daughter, when an only daughter, was raped. And then, because of that incident, two of his sons went out and killed all the people at Shechem. Right? Once again, this is not the place God told him to go. So God is taking things away from him and letting him know where you should go. Because I told you I am the God of Bethel. I'm letting you know to go back to the place where you made the vow and place where I promised you. Go back to that land. <clears throat> After his two sons, Simeon and Levi, they killed all the people. Now, verse 35, and now he moved up to Bethel. He now remembers that he has to go back to Bethel. So where is God is leading him to? Bethel. Then the question is, why Bethel? Why can he leave other places like Sukkot or Shechem? Why can he leave somewhere else? It's pretty close by to where the Bethel is. Right, but what's up with this particular place? What's there? What makes this place so special that why is God is driving him to Bethel? Why he just keep emphasizing on the God of Bethel? I want you to go back to Bethel. What's up with this Bethel? What's a big deal? Why can't we live somewhere near here? It's like, well, God is telling you to live in the Miami. Well, I settled in Fort Lauderdale. It's pretty close. You know, it's not far. It's right next. Can I be there? Do I have to go to Miami? What's so special about Miami? There is a two reason why God is driving him to Bethel. First of all, that's where he made the promise. That's where he said, this pillar, the stone, will be your house. I will build an altar here, not elsewhere. And then two, what is the meaning Bethel? I asked this question many times. <laughs> yes, bait. Bait means house. 
El means God. So house of God. So what is God telling him? Stay in my house. Don't go elsewhere. Not near. Not close. Stay in my house. Don't go elsewhere. I told you to go back to my room, my house. But he just settled in very close to the Bethel. This is good enough. Why do I have to go to Bethel? It's pretty close. It's my father's land. So what's a big deal, God? But God is saying, close enough is not what I want. Live in my house. So God is driving him to live in the house. So he now moved up to Bethel. And then that's where where he built an altar. And then he says, in verse 2, So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Get rid of the foreign gods you have with you. So what does this mean? What does this mean? That means Jacob knew all, his, all of his household is carrying all this pagan things. Right? Get rid of the foreign gods. So they were worshipping foreign gods all this time. And he knew it. He didn't do anything. He just kept it and let them have all those foreign gods. And let the, his, let all, all of his household to worship. Remember what Rachel did? When he was leaving his father's place, what did, what did she do? Correct. So she even brought. So his wife was worshipping other gods. And Jacob was okay with that too. And now he's telling him, and telling his household, so now it's about time to go to Bethel, now get rid of all these foreign gods and change your clothes. So now, okay, I understand that you have to get rid of all these foreign gods. Then why do you have to change clothes? Because their clothes were a little dirty and not washed or like it's not brand new or like well what is it? Thanks, right? No idea. All right. All right. Let's take a look at Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 3. I don't know how much you know about Zechariah. Zechariah is like a, um, it's like a Old Testament's revelation is a Zechariah. Zechariah is very similar to Revelation. We're going to take a look at Zechariah chapter 3. <coughs> Then he showed, oh, okay, it has to be quick. It 
And if you if you're looking at the index, you're you're not you're you're not just you know quick enough. You shouldn't be looking at the index. You, you see, this is this is a HD uh, a camera that I can see you like see what you're doing. <laughs> 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 Zechariah chapter 3 we're going to read from verse 1 then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at the right side to accuse him the Lord said to Satan the Lord rebuke you Satan the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? Now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. The angel said to those who were standing before him, Take off his filthy clothes. Then he said to Joshua, See, I have taken away your sins, and I will put rich garment on you. Then I said, Put a clean turban on his head, so they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him while the angel of the Lord stood by. So, here's the Joshua. Who is this Joshua? No. <laughs> yeah. So, who is this? Who is this Joshua? So go back to Haggai. Haggai, the books that you don't really read or know. <laughs> That's right before Zechariah. Yep. Yeah. Chapter 1. Yeah. Verse 1, in the second year of a king Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of uh, Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. So, there are two names you, s you see. One is Joshua. And the, the other one is Zerubbabel. So Zerubbabel was what? He was governor of Judah. And high priest was Joshua. After uh, the people of Judah was captured as a, cap, um, as a prisoner to uh, Babylon. And after they were living in Babylonian uh, the land. Later on, the Persian, the king, who is the king who destroyed the Babylon? Hmm? No. Who? Hmm. Who is the king who destroyed uh, um, the Babylonian Empire? Forgot. Of course, it's a Persian. <laughs> I just said the, the Persian king. <laughs> Cyrus is the one who destroyed the Babylonians. So after the Persian king Cyrus actually took over the Babylonian Empire, 
he released the Judeans to go back to his land. When he sent all the Israelites back to their own land, Judah, he sent along with governor uh, Zerubbabel and the high priest Joshua came back. Okay? Zechariah Joshua is this high priest. Alright? Now, Joshua, what is the meaning of name Joshua? Do you know? Joshua is a Hebrew word. It means save. Save. It's a salvation. In Greek word Joshua is Jesus. So, Hebrew word Joshua, if you translate into Greek <coughs> Joshua, it becomes Jesus. High priest, his name is Joshua, which is Jesus in Greek word. Now, he dressed with filthy clothes, and the angel told the angel standing by Joshua and said, Take off his clothes, put on the new clothes to make him clean. So when we look at the Zechariah again, chapter 3, he said, reason for him to take off this filthy cloth is because what? When you look at chapter 3, verse 4, at the end, he said, then he said to Joshua, See, I have taken away your sin. So what does this filthy clothes mean? Sin. It's a sin. Right? And I will put rich garments on you. So he's putting on a new cloth. A new garment. Now the question is, what is this new garment mean? Because that's that's the point we're trying to, you know, understand, right? Jacob was telling his household to change your clothes, right? So the clothes that they were wearing is what? Is your sins. Now take off your sins. And put on a new garment. What does this new garment mean? Is the question. Now, you will remember when you go back to, not go back actually, when you turn to uh, Book of Luke, chapter 15. Book of Luke. That's something you can easily find without looking at the index. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Chapter fifteen. We're going to read from verse eleven. Jesus continued. There was a man who had two sons. The younger son said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had to set off a distant country, and these uh, squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country. And he began to uh, to be in need. So he went and hired himself out, of, out to a citizen of that country who sent him uh, to his fields to feed pigs. He longed uh, to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but not one gave him anything. 
when he came to his senses. He said, How many of my father's hired men have uh, have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to say to him, Father, I have sinned against the heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against the heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandal on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Now, when the lost son, the prodigal son, came back to his father, what did he do? Yeah, what did, what did the father do to his son? <laughs> right? Now, then, then what is this means? Now let's turn to Galatians. Mm -hmm. It is all connected, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Good. All right. Galatians, Galatians chapter 3, and we're going to read verse 26 and 27. <clears throat> Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 and 7. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. So what did they put on? They clothed with what? Correct. The new garment is Christ. So let's turn to Exodus this time. Exodus chapter 28 Exodus All right, we're going to read this have Aaron your brother brought to you from among the Israelites along with his sons Nadab and Abihu Eleazar and Ithamar so they may serve me as priest make sacred garments for your brother Aaron and give him dignity and honor Tell all the skilled men to whom I have given wisdom in such matter that they are to make garments for Aaron for his consecration so he may serve me as priest. Priest, the, These are the garments they are to make, a breast piece, an epode, a robe, uban tunic, a turban, and a sash. They are to make these sacred garments for your brother Aaron and his son so they may serve me as a priest to have them use gold and blue and purples and scarlet and yarn and fine linen. And then continue on. When you look at verse 2, it says, Make 
sacred garments for your brother Aaron to give him dignity and honor. So what makes this priest honor and dignity? The garment that he's wearing. It's the priest himself that is not holy or they're not they don't have any dignity or they don't have any honors. But when they put on this garment, now they put on a dignity and they actually become holy person for them, for them to do sacred, uh, sacrifice on behalf of Israelites. So what makes the priest holy? Because of the garment. Why? I just already explained to you. So now you'll be able to actually connect the dots here, see what this means. Right? So they take off their sins and then put on a new garment, so put on a Christ. So this is like a symbolism. So come back to uh, Genesis chapter 35, verse 3. Then come. Let us go up to Bethel. Now he realizes he needs to go to Bethel. Until, until this time, he didn't know that he had to go back to Bethel because he already forgot what he actually you know, uh, made a promise. Where I will build an, build an altar to God who answered me in the day of my distress and who has been with me wherever I have gone. So this particular piece of statement that is making you need to pay attention to what he's saying I'm gonna read it again then come let us go up to Bethel where I will build an altar to God who answer me in the day of my distress so he knows God answered his prayer and two who has been with me wherever I have gone so he knows that God was with him Right, So he knows God answered, and he knows that God was with him. Now, if he knows, why was he so afraid of his brother Esau? That he had to break up all those groups, you know? That he actually put all the, you know, um, the, the, his wife's, uh, the, uh, the servants, and the kids in front of the groups, and then the Leah and his they're, they're right, you know, you know, kill, kill them first, right? Sort of. Right. Why was he so afraid? So he had to send all his household, you know, ahead of them, and he was a staying by himself. If he knows that God was with him, not only that. If you go back, you probably didn't pay attention. You know, when you go back here on the uh, chapter thirty-two, we're going to just read one more time here. Chapter 32, it says, verse 1, Jacob also went on his way, and angels of God met him. When Jacob saw them, he said, This is the camp of God, so he named the place Mahanaim. So, before he met his brother Esau, God showed him that angels are with him. And he saw it. He saw the angel was with him, and he knew that God was with him. But what he knew didn't matter. He was afraid. So he had to, you know, come up with a plan and strategy, how he's going to lay out all these people. And he followed his own wisdom. And it's sort of, it's like he followed his stupidity. So this is the kind of, you know, th this kind of shows who we are. We know God is with us, but when the situation comes, when there's a difficult time comes, we completely forget that God is with us. So we try to search for our own answer. Like, so what do we do now? What can we do? Now, I want you to think about when the difficult time comes, when you're really, really lonely, who do you really think of? Is that God or someone else? Exactly. 
we rely on people more than God. We know God is with us, but it doesn't matter. We still do what we think is right for us. Jacob knew that God was with him, but didn't matter. So, think about it. We all know God save us. We know God is with us. But what does that knowledge do to our do to us? Absolutely nothing. And Jacob was no different. Now, he knew all this in verse four at verse four. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods they had and rings in their ears, and Jacob buried them under the oak at Shechem. Then they set out, and the terror of God fell upon the towns all around them, so that no one pursued them. So, the people of that town, because of what his son had done, Jacob's son had done, Simeon and, and Levi had done, because they all, the, you know, they all killed the people of Shechem, and they took the, their children, they took the animals, they took all the plunders with them. So all the people around the surrounded town was so mad, that, so they were about to like go and kill you know, Jacob's family. But God actually gave the, you know, it's like fear upon them, and it's like, don't do anything. Don't do anything stupid here. So when they heard that, as they were so fearful, so they didn't pursue the Jacob's family. So God was there and protecting him. God was there to just making sure that nobody harms him. Remember when his, you know, when he left his uncle, right? And then his uncle was pursued him, and then God appeared in his dream and he said, mm -mm -mm -mm, "Don't do anything." bad to Jacob so God was there to protect them God was always there in the behind and, and protect Jacob as he promised that I will be with you he didn't trust the God so I want you to think about it from God's perspective I want you to put yourself in God's shoes how would you feel that you're trying to protect you, you know you've been protecting your loved ones always from the back but he doesn't or she doesn't trust you that you're doing anything, then how would you feel that you've been doing all you can to protect that person? Would you feel good? Would you like to help that person? So you're going to say like, <laughs> right? You basically wash it off and say, okay, I'm, I'm through here. You do what you want. You walk away, right? Yeah, it is a gracious God, but I want you to remember, God has the same emotions that we have. We are created in His image. People just sometimes forget that, you know, people think that God doesn't have any feelings or, or emotion. Oh, He's God. That's okay. It's God. He's gracious, so He will forgive us. So, no big deal. No. I want you to feel His heart. This is why we're learning this Old Testament. If you don't feel anything, and if you don't put yourself in his shoes and how painful it is and how hard he feels about us and his people, then you never understand the love of cross. You have to feel this in your heart. This is why we're learning this Old Testament.
Because those things you can't learn in the New Testament. But it's all here in Old Testament. You will find many places God is furious, He's crying, and His heart, He's hurted, He's so painful that He's crying. You have to feel His heart. So God has been hurted because He promised many times, I will be with you. One thing I want to show you something. <clears throat> the chapters you guys probably know very well. to see that God is actually you know so painful to see his loved ones just abandon him and don't, does not trust him I want you to turn huh? one thing to keep in mind do you know who hurts you the most the people who you love is the one who hurts you the most and that pain is the most severe pain that you will get here's the thing if you get caught you're bleeding oh I got caught then you just you know went to a doctor's office to you know get treated right now you know how much scars and how much you know wounds you have. You can see, then you'll see it as a healing. Oh, it's getting better now. I can just all wounds are gone, right? But when your heart has been wounded, you have no idea how much you have wounded. And it doesn't get healed easily. It is so deep that it's just like hurt so much. There's sometimes that the scars you have could prolong for like throughout your life. It doesn't get treated well. It doesn't get, you know, healed well. So what really hurts, you know, if your mother, if your, you know, best friend, your husband or wife, your, you know, whoever close to you and hurts you, it's very difficult to bear that pain. Same goes to God. God loved Jacob so much. He was chasing after him and taking care of him from the back. But he doesn't trust him. And he sees. And he keep, goes back and he just keeps helping. You abandon me, but I keep coming back to you. Also, he was hurted. But he was to keep chasing him and protecting him. And you'll see more after this. Now, come back to uh, verse 6. Jacob, all the people with him came to lose. That is Bethel. In the land of Canaan, there he built an altar. And he called the place El Bethel because it was there that God revealed himself to him when he was a fleeing from his brother. Now he remembers after he came back. Now Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died and was buried under the oak below Bethel, so he was named Elon Bakut. After Jacob returned from Padan Aram, God appeared to him again and blessed him. Now, I want you to think about this. Jacob's been abandoning him. 
And he only searched and only looked for God when he needed help. When he was in fear, when he needed God for what he needs, he called out God's name. And it brings up all this promise God made. You made this promise. You have to just protect me when he needed. So I want you to think about it. I want you to put yourself in God's shoes one more time. How would you feel there are people who only comes to you when they need something and then when they get what they need and they walk away, they never call you, they never say hi, they don't, they don't even look. Then whenever they need something, they keep coming back to you and ask for something. How would you feel? Would you feel good? Right. If you feel that way, how would God feel? And I want you to think about it. You know, it's it's not about me. Now, I, I want you to like, you know, think about it from God's perspective instead of your perspective. Perspective changes a lot of things, right? You have to put yourself in God's shoes and how he feels about Jacob, about me. You know, if I were in his shoes and I said, forget it, man. I walk away. I don't want to see you anymore. Go away. Get out of my way. Beat it. Right? That's what I will do. But you know what? What God does is different. What is He doing? He's again bless Jacob. And I go like, why? Why? It doesn't make any sense. That's not what I would do. I know what I will do. But that's not what God is doing. God is again blessing. He's heard it. I want you to think about what Jesus said on the cross. What did he say on the cross? What would you do? I want you to be, I want you to be in God's position. Okay? You have your son. Okay? And you're killing your son to save other people. Right? You're killing other people to save. Then people who you're trying to save don't appreciate what you're doing. Then how would you feel? Would you do it? You wouldn't. Why? You would not forgive them. And what Jesus is doing is forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. You think it is an easy thing to say. No, it is not. Oh, I want to show you something. I want you to turn to Malachi. Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. Right before Matthew. <laughs> so, before you turn then, I'm going to ask you this. 
both of you. What do you know? What do you know about Malachi? What is this Malachi about? About, about tight. Yeah, most people think this Malachi is about tight. That's that's when most people reference in Malachi. Malachi is not that kind of book at all. And if you really understand the Malachi. You know, when I was reading Malachi after I went through the Old Testament, Malachi is the book that I cry the most. I teared so much when I was reading this book after I understood the Old Testament. I cried so much when I was reading Malachi. And after you understand all the Old Testament, you would understand why I say, why I teared so much while, while I was reading this book. I want to show you just one part. Turn to chapter 1. I'm going to read this. An oracle, the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord. But you ask, how have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother? The Lord says, Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated, and I have turned his mountains into a wasteland and left his inheritance to the desert, Jekyll. Edom may say, Though we have been crushed, we will rebuild the ruins. But this is what the Lord Almighty says, They may build, but I will demolish. They will be called the wicked land, a people always under the wrath of the Lord. You will see it with your own eyes and say, Great is the Lord even beyond the borders of Israel. Now, I want you to understand, let me explain a little bit. Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. God loved Israel from the beginning. God always loved Israel. Always and no matter what situation, whether they turn back on God, God always loved them. He loved thousands of years. He never abandoned Israel. He always loved them. And God says, I have loved you. And your answer is, how have you loved us? What do you mean you loved us? You loved us? I don't remember you loved us. When? And I want you to remember this. Just like what I just explained to you before. You gave your son. You gave everything to that person. He, you loved that person so much. And you gave your whole heart. Everything what you had, you gave it to that person. And that person turns back on you and says, What did you do to me? Did you do anything for me? Then how would you feel? Right. God poured his heart onto us. God gave everything to us. He loved us so much. But we turn back and say, like, when did you love me? I don't remember you loved me. This is what we are feeling. And this 
book is not about type. This book is about how people of Israel is turning back on him and then saying, I don't know what you did to us. I don't know what have you done? Did you love us at all? I only remember you slashed us. You always rebuked us. I don't remember anything you have done. And this is what God heard. Makes him speechless. He doesn't know what to say. You don't remember that I loved you? Really? You have to feel his heart. Until you feel his heart, you will never understand how God felt. And then after he was so hurted, and he still sent his one and only son to these same people. How are you, Tyler? It's been a long time. Uh, because uh, everybody had some other schedules and stuff, so. Genesis chapter 35. Yeah. No, we'll just continue on. And then imagine after we've gone through all this Old Testament, if I try to explain this Malachi, you'll be like shocked. Okay. And you will understand why I teared so much while I was reading that Malachi. But you have to go through all this pains and sorrow and he's you know how much he was hurted then you would understand what I mean then come back to chapter 35 and then verse 9 after Jacob returned from Padan Aram God appeared to him again and blessed him well I, I don't know what to say I, I don't it doesn't really I don't know how to describe it. What are you doing, God? God said to him, Your name is Jacob, but you will no longer be called Jacob. Your name will be Israel. So he named him Israel. Wait a second. Did an angel name to him and change his name from Jacob to Israel before? Right? So why did he change his name from Jacob to Israel? I want you to think about this for a moment. Yeah, chapter 35. No. Remember, go back to, go back to why Isaac named him Jacob. That w wasn't was not a, a prophecy, but he grabbed his brother Esau's what heel. Right, he grabbed his brother's heel. That's why his name became Jacob, grabbing. That's why he grabs something, he will never let it go, right? Just like we have something that we like, we want, right? I want this, and then you grab it, you know? And then God changed his name to Israel. So what does Israel mean? 
we wrestle, right? Wrestle with. So, why did God change his name from Israel? So, obviously, Sarah L. L is obviously God, right? And Sarah means wrestle. So, wrestle with God. Why God is wrestling? Well, the thing is, throughout your life, you will always wrestle with God. Here's the thing. Let's go back to what happened when he was wrestling with the angel. Let's go back. Chapter 32, verse 24 and on. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hips, so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, Let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So what does he want? What does Jacob want? He wants blessing. Un even though my hip socket is, you know, gone, it's okay. As long as I get what I want, which is blessing. You give me what I want then I will let you go. But until you give me what I want, I won't let you go. So what is he doing? So from his perspective, right? From his perspective, he doesn't care. But he wants to get what he wants. Now, when you look at this one, I want you to think about it. what we do. When we pray, what are we really praying for? For our needs. What I want to get done. So most people pray for what? God, please help me to find a job. God, please help me to get into this school. God, please bless my business so that my business could run well. God, Help me to get healed. God, this, that, this. We've been praying for what? We always pray for what I want and what I need. I don't care what God wants, but it's more important for me to get what I need. So most of our prayer is, give me this, give me that, give me, give me, give me. Is most of our prayer. Right? Isn't that what it is? So now, what do we really think about what God wants? Do we know what God wants? We don't really care about what He wants. We always think about what we want. Right. We don't really care how He feels. We don't really care what He wants. We do what we want. When we come to Him because we need something, Lord, please give me this. Give me that, we pray. And then when we get what we want, we forget. We walk away. We forgot about God. We don't come to Him as often. We don't search Him that much. So from Jacob's perspective, I don't care that you have to go. He said, daybreak is come. Let me go. I don't care. Who cares about you? 
I care about myself. What I want is more important than what you need. So what he wants is, I do not care what you need to do, what you have to do, until you give me what I want. So what I want is more important. And he won't let it go. So the angel had to bless him. I will bless you. What's your name? My name is Jacob. Oh, I see. Your name is Jacob. It says it all. All right? You won't let, let it go. So I'll bless you. So he got what he wants. Now, be careful what you ask for. He got what he asked for. Now, he's now receiving the blessing from the time when his one and only daughter got raped. What? I'm sorry? Did you just say, like, one and only daughter got raped was blessing? Is it blessing? Would you call it a blessing? And his son, two of his sons, became a killer and did all these wrong things to the people around him? Is that a blessing? Wait a second. Until now, didn't he receive all the blessing from God? From the time when he stealed his brother's blessing, didn't he receive the blessing from so many different people? And he's been living for this blessing? So he received all the blessing from God. And God himself has said, again, blessed him. What blessing? What blessing? He received all the blessing from his brother Esau, right? Who's more richer? Esau. So what blessing? Then you may call it, wait a second, something's not right. Where's my blessing? What happened? I received so many blessing here. What happened? Exactly. What is blessing? First of all, his daughter was raped. His two of his sons became killer. Now he came back to Bethel. Now he gave, the, you know, he actually built an altar. Now, Continue to read. Verse 10. God said to him, Your name is Jacob, but you will no longer be called Jacob. Your name will be Israel. So he named him Israel. And God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and increase in number. A nation and a community of nations will come from you, and kings will come from your body. The land I give to Abraham and Isaac, and I'll also give to you. And I will give this land to your descendant after you. Then God went up from him at the place where he had talked with him. Jacob set up a stone pillar at the place where God had talked with him, and he poured out a drink offering on it, and he also poured oil on it. Jacob called the place where God had talked with him Bethel. Now, God promised to him that I am God Almighty, be fruitful and increase in numbers, a nation and community of nation will come from you. A nation and a community of nation will come from you. And kings will come from your body. All this promise that God made to him, Jacob never saw. Right? He never saw. Something will happen in the future. Who knows? How do I know? It doesn't happen in my lifetime. But God made a promise. It will be done as I promise. So he set up a stone pillar and he poured a water and then he poured oil on it. Now, I mentioned this before. In the Bible, 
When you see stone, it means Jesus. I will explain why it is. Okay? Now, do you remember the uh, uh, Jesus' parable about building a house? Where should you build a house? Should you build a house on the sand or should you build a house on rock? Now, what happens to the house that you build on the stone uh, on the sand? What ha what happens when you build a house on stone? So is that means that God is telling you when you build your house and making sure that you build your house on, you know, strong base and stone? Now, what does he mean by it? What is that stone? Correct. Build your house on rock. That rock is the cornerstone that Jesus is referenced. Build a house. So the base has to be rock. Now, you understood that rock is Jesus. Now I'm going to ask you a question. So what does that mean, build a house on the rock and build a house on Jesus? What does that mean then? How do you do that? So we build the God gave the parable said build a house on rock we now understood that the rock means Jesus so what does that mean you build a house on Jesus what does that mean how do you do that in your in your the real life how do you build the house on on Jesus what do you do okay Jesus center okay about other people. When you turn to John chapter 1, it says this, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, He was with God in the beginning. Can someone explain to me what that means? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. So we'll get to that later on, you know, not today, but so the Word is Jesus, right? So, verse 14 says, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the One and Only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So, the Word is what? Jesus. Okay, let's just connect this together. Build a house on rock. Okay? Rock is Jesus. Jesus is the Word. Okay, so what does that mean? Build a house on the Word. Now, I want you to remember this. How many people do you think know this the Word in and out? Not many. People's been coming to church years and years and years. They still don't know the words. There's so many books that they have not read. There's so many books that they don't understand. Well, so build the house on rock. Are we doing it? Barely. Now we are. That's correct. Now we are. But many of the Christians, they come to church, they do everything else except this. They don't build a house.
So what are they doing then? What are they doing? They're building a house on sand. It looks nice, but when the travel time comes, that house, no matter how beautiful, how big you built, it crumbles so easily. The people who build their house on rock, on Jesus, on the Word, they never be shaken because they put their feet on the Word. They know God does not change. They know the promise God made. Until that time, it will always going to be like this, like a reed, going back and forth, back and forth. It's like building a house on sand. They do everything. They do all the church activity. They serve. They do this. They do that. They go to missions. They, they do everything. It's like building a nice house, but there's no foundation. No word, no Jesus. And our base of Christianity has to be on Jesus. Coming back. So he set up a stone pillar, placed water on it, and then he put oils on it. Just I want you to just draw that line, verse 14, and we'll come back to this one when we study Exodus. Now, verse 16. Then they moved on from Bethel, while they were still some distance from um, Ephrath, Rachel began to give birth and had great difficulty. And as she was having great difficulty in childbirth, the uh, midwife said to her, Don't be afraid, for you have another son. As she breathed her last, for she was dying, she named her son Ben-Oni, but his father named him Benjamin. So... Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is, Bethlehem. Over her tomb, Jacob set up a pillar and do this day, uh, to this day, and that pillar marks Rachel's tomb. Now, go back what's happening here. After he wrestled with angel, then he was blessed. Soon after he settled at Sukkot, his one and only daughter got raped. His two of his sons became a killer and had done wrong to the people. And now, his most loved one, Rachel, died. I want you to think about it. I want you to put yourself in his shoes. This is happening in your life. How would you feel? Would you feel that God is with you? Would you feel that you are blessed? How would you feel? Now, it's getting worse and worse. Okay? It's getting worse and worse. Now he lost the most loved one. That he spent 14 years to get Rachel. Because he loved Rachel so much. That's why when he break up the groups, he kept Rachel and Rachel's son, Joseph, with him. Why did he keep Joseph? Because Joseph is Rachel's son. Do you understand? Rachel was the most loved one. And then now, she, he lost. Now I want you to think about it. This is happening to your life. After you bless by the angel. What is happening here? What's going on? Am I 
cursed or am I blessed? Would you feel, oh, God is blessing me now. I see. Is that how you feel? No. You'll be angry at God. You may be screaming at God. What are you doing this to me? Why? Why me? And I don't understand then. What is blessing? What is blessing then? Oh God continued to bless them and he always wanted to get blessing all he received was blessing from his youth right God is God is stripping him off taking what is important for him He's taking apart Jacob. He's kind of stripping him off. No. This, he's taking away that Jacob thought is the most important thing. This I cannot compromise. I have to keep this. I will never let it go. This is mine. This is what I care. This is the most important thing to me. But God is taking away from him. One by one. And he's losing it. He's losing control. He's losing the things that he kept. And it's so important to him. Why God is doing this. Why is God taking away what he thinks it is important to him? This is it. So at the end, we're going to just kind of like, you know, fast forward a little bit. And we go to chapter 47 Genesis chapter 47 verse 8 and 9 Pharaoh asked him how old are you and Jacob said to Pharaoh the years of my pilgrimage are the hundred and thirty my ears have been few and difficult, and they do not equal the years of pilgrimage of my fathers. My life has been difficult. That was a confession. His life was rough, difficult. Until this happened, that until the, he wrestled with angel. Everything was going good. He was getting what he wanted it. Right? He used his own wisdom and his strategy to keep what he wants. Everything was going well. Seems like everything going the way he planned. But after he wrestled with the angel, things turned south. What's going on here? This is not what is supposed to happen. But this is exactly what is happening to him in his real life. Imagine, after he lost Rachel, how would he feel? Imagine. You both marry, have a daughter and sons. Your son and your daughters got raped. Your son became a killer. Now, Bryce lost you. Bryce, how would you feel? 
you'll be like, oh, sad. It was, will be not only devastating, it's just like you'll lose your mind. It'd be very difficult for us to tolerate. You have to know this. This is just a happening very short time. One after another. And all three things are happening almost very short time. All those disastrous things are happening one at a time. You will lose your life. Oh my, you probably don't know what to do. I would not know what to do. I just put myself in ja you know, Jacob's shoes. What would I feel if this is happening in my life? I don't want you to look at it from you know, someone who looks at the news. I want you to put yourself in his shoes. You have, you have to be him to feel this. Unless you put yourself in his shoes and feel the things that he feels, you can't say you read this book. And I always reference this with some incidents that occurred a few years ago. I don't know if you remember the incidents that one of the guy walked into a elementary schools and he shot all the kids. Remember that? that happened during um, Thanksgiving time. A few years ago it happened. And I watched that news and I felt sorry for those parents who lost their sons and daughters. Because I myself as my daughters, I felt as I was watching the news. Oh, I feel bad. But you know what? That night, I had a good dinner. I was able to have a good dinner with my family. When I turned away from that news, we were talking something else. I didn't talk about the things. We talked about our family things. I was able to eat dinner without a problem. I want you to put yourself in your parents' shoes. Would you feel like to eat dinner that night? That you lost your son? That lost your daughter? If you are their children's parent, how would you feel? Me, I was reading or watching the news. I can turn away and eat dinner, no problem. But if I am that parent, I cannot think about eating dinner that night. If I lost my son, if I lost my daughter that afternoon, my daughter was a killed, I cannot eat. I cannot think about eating dinner that night. You see how different that is? We as a person, as a third person watching the news versus you as a parent, how different it is to feel. When you read the Bible, you need to put yourself in their shoes. Then you will feel how they feel. And then you will feel how God feels about us. Until you feel that, you can't say, I read it, that I understood it. It's, about, it's not about understanding. I watched that news, I understood. Their dear sons, their daughters died. But it's not about understanding. As a parent who lost their children, it's not about understanding. It's about how they feel they lost their children. When you read the scripture, you have to feel until you feel, don't ever say that you read it 
that you understood it. You have to feel how Jacob feels. Now he would probably realize how God feels about him. And I always think, why did God give us a family? Do we have to have a family? In God's plan? Do we have to have a family? Then why did God give us a family then? see in family I mean eventually you will have your own family and you will have your own children when you have your own family now you will understand something different that you never understood it before once you become a parent you would understand your parents a little more when you became a parent when you have your children. And I, every time I talk to my daughters, sometimes my daughters, you know, obviously have different opinions than me, obviously, right? So when I talk to them, you know, they just completely disobey me, they don't listen. Sometimes we got into an argument Right? Every time I have that kind of a conflict with my daughters, after I finish that conversation, looking, I, I feel like I'm looking at myself. It's like a reflection of me that I'm against my God. That's me that I'm doing to my Lord. How I feel is how He feels. Now, since I became a parent, I understand how my parents felt. It's, it's different. It's different than how you think you understand, than how you feel. It will be completely different. So the feeling is different than knowing or understanding. As I mentioned before, let's say there's a two people. One fell in love with someone. The other person never fell in love with anybody but read a book on love. Study, research, read about so many books about love. One person never read the book, fell in love versus the person who never fell in love to read and research and write a book on love. Who do you think will know about love? Love is not a knowledge. Love is how you feel. Right? It doesn't matter how much you, you know, you read, how many books you read, how much you researched, doesn't really matter. If you never felt in love, you will never understand about love. Indescribable feeling. Feeling is not the same as knowing. When we read the scripture, you have to feel. What do you have to feel? Not only you have to feel dear life, but also you have to know the God's heart. 
I will give you a perfect example. I want you to turn to Hosea. So, <laughs> so when you turn to Hosea, Hosea was God's prophet, right? It was a God's prophet. So, God loved Israel. God loved Judah, but neither of Israel or Judah understood the love of God. God said, I am your husband, but Israel, as a wife, never looked at his husband, her husband, always looked for other men. God was a hurting. I am your husband. Why are you running away from me? I care for you. I give you what you need. Turn back to me. But the Israel and the Judah was keep turning away from her husband. And Hosea didn't understand. So God told Hosea, Hosea, I want you to get married to a woman but not a normal woman. Not a normal woman. What kind of woman? Adulterous woman. Adulterous woman. I want you to get married. And then, after he got married to Gomel, and when she was running away from Hosea, he started to understand how God feels. Now I know, God, how you feel. Hosea, as a prophet, did not understand until he felt himself, until he experienced himself, he didn't understand how God feels. He was crying. He was hurted. He was betrayed. He was rejected. But even prophet couldn't understand. God was so hurt. How come you don't understand me? I'm trying to explain to you, but you, you don't get it. You don't understand how I feel. So I want you to feel this. When you get married to this woman, you would understand. I'll show you another case. I want you to turn to Ezekiel. Um, hang on one second. <coughs> Chapter 24. Ezekiel chapter 24, verse 15 and on. The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, with one bowl I am about to take away from you the delight, the light of your eyes. Yet do not lament or weep or shed any tears. Groan quietly. Do not moan for the dead. Keep your turban fastened and your sandals on your feet. Do not cover the lower part of your face or eat the customary food of your moaners. So I spoke to the people in the morning and in the evening my wife died. The next morning I did as I had been commanded. Do you know what that means? If you don't understand the context of Ezekiel, you will never understand what this means. 
God is about to kill his wife, Israel and Judah. Nobody understood how he feels, how God feels to kill his wife, the loved one, most the careful, most the loved one. Then Ezekiel did not understand. So he told Ezekiel, Ezekiel, I'm going to take away what you love. I don't want you to moan. I don't want you to weep. I, want, I don't want you to cover your Lord part. You know what that means? You're sobbing. Do not do that. God does not even allow him to cry for his wife's death. I'm going to take away from you. Once you lose your wife, you would understand how I feel. And after he lost his wife, Ezekiel realized how God feels. Until that point, Ezekiel did not understand how God feels. There are so many places God has been crying because no one understood him. No one feel what God feels. No one knew how he feels. So he was so painful. He didn't know what to do. He was crying. He was sobbing. He was moaning to kill his own wife. Nobody understood. Same thing to Hosea. Nobody understood what God was doing. That's why the Malachi said, I loved you. When did you love me? So you have to feel his heart when you read Old Testament. So when Jacob lost his loved wife, Rachel, he probably felt, I lost everything what I have. Rachel was everything in my life. That's all I had. She's gone. He probably didn't know what to do. God can't even think about it. It's just, he's lost, completely lost. He didn't know what to do now. Pray? Forget it. Can't even think about praying. His mind is completely gone. He had to build his Rachel's tomb as he was burying his lovely wife. Imagine how he felt. Continue on, verse 21. Israel moved on again and pitched his tent beyond Midgar Eder while Israel was living in that region. Reuben went in and slept with his father's concubine, Bilhah, and Israel heard of it. Once again, one after another, never stopping, it just keep going bad. It's like nothing good is happening. All these disastrous things are happening in his life. One after another. Doesn't even giving him a chance to restore himself. He's completely paralyzed. What's going on in my life? How would you feel if this is happening in your life? I don't know what to do if, if this is happening in my life. First son, Reuben, for Israelites, first son is very, very important. Reuben is the first son. Now he 
slept with his wife. Can you imagine? Right after he lost his wife, Rachel, now his son, the first son, is sleeping with his wife. How would you feel? You have to feel this. You have to feel his pain and his sorrow, desperation. Now continue on. Jacob had 12 sons, the sons of Leah, Reuben, the first son of Jacob, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Jebelun, the sons of Rachel, Joseph, and Benjamin, the sons of Rachel's maidservant, Bilhah, Dan, and Naphtali, the sons of Leah's maidservant, Zilpah, Gad, and Asher. These were the sons of Jacob who were born to him in Padan Aram. Jacob came home to his father Isaac in Mamre, near Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, where the Abraham had and Isaac had stayed. Isaac lived a hundred and eight eighty years. Then he breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people, old and full of years, and his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. Now, what's happening? What is happening? He lost Rachel. Rachel's maid servant, Bilhah, slept with his first son. Now his father died. Now, one after another, nothing good is happening. Blessing? Would you feel this is a blessing? Would you believe that God is with you at this point? You might have actually thrown God out. I don't need him. I don't need your blessing. Get away. I don't want to do anything with you. Stay away from my life. You don't think you will feel that way. But if you, in his shoes, you may feel different. You probably feel that God is not there. You'll be angry. So what is this? God said God loved Jacob. Didn't he say that? What love? Isn't it what Malachi said? I loved you. Then what would be your answer in this situation? Would you answer the same thing? What love? When did you love me? I don't remember that you loved me. You're not with me. Don't lie. Wouldn't you say that? Same thing. Everywhere you turn, you will find God says, I loved Jacob. I don't understand. You loved Jacob. Doesn't make any sense. I want you to turn to Job. You know that Job went through the difficult time as well, correct? And let's turn to Job 
chapter 7. Chapter 7. Chapter 7 is a continuation from chapter 6, which is what Job is saying. Okay? We're going to read verse 17, 18, 19. What is man that you make so much of him, that you give him so much attention, that you examine him every morning and test him every moment? Will you never look away from me or let me alone even for an instant? What does that mean? What are you doing? You're not even giving me a time to do anything. You're watching over me. You're testing me every morning. Why? I need a time to rest you're not giving me a chance to breathe. Why are you doing this to me? This is his cry. Because he could not bear the pain. He didn't know what to do. What is this? You're doing this to me. Isn't that what is happening to Jacob as well? one after another. Okay, listen to the recording. Okay. All right. Bye. So, I mean, time's up. So we can't go much further. But you would understand all this story, what I'm trying to explain to you. So once again. You have to read the Bible as dynamically as possible. That you have to put yourself in their shoes. When you watch the 3D movie, I don't know if you, did you watch the, the, no, not Interstellar, but uh, what's the, what was the movie, uh, James Cameron's movie? Avatar. Did you watch it in 3D movies? You didn't? You should have watched it in 3D movies. Yeah. So the thing is, when you, when you watch that, when you watch that in 3D movies, when he is looking down from the top and looking down the hill, that's real when you look at it from 3, 3D movies. As if you're standing up there, you're looking down. That's different from 2D movies because there's no dimensional view. When you read the scripture, you have to feel as if you're watching 3D movies. You have to feel as if you are standing there. You have to feel as if you are feeling his life. Then you would understand what this means, why God is doing what he's doing, and how they feel, then it will touch your heart. You probably never seen the scripture as this as this you know this way. You probably never felt it. You just read it through and you understood and you know the story. But you never felt it before what is really happening in his life. We're going to get to continue to 
you know, see his life and on next Friday. Any questions about the stuff that we covered today? No? You know, something like this happened and you start to write as your diary, as if you're bleeding, right? And then someone who reads that diary and laugh at your diary as they reading, how would you feel? You wrote that diary as we're bleeding and you're tearing with your pain and you word by word you're tearing out as you're writing that. And then someone is reading as if like, huh, fun, okay, now I understand. Then if you see that, how would you feel? That is exactly what is happening today. How many times have we read the Genesis? Like how come nobody really cares about how he feels? What he wrote, word by word, in his pain, he wrote all this. Described it, how he felt. Nobody seemed to care. Then they say, I love you, Lord. And I want you to think about it. Did you say you love me? Did you just say you love me? I need you to feel his heart. He's crying. He's tearing. He's bursting out. He's always crying. But nobody seemed to care. And everywhere they go, they praise. They say, I love you, Lord. But nobody seemed to care. It's not love. I'll give you one example. I heard of a story of a, a man who used to work at the uh, Twin Tower before it fell. And then one day he was driving a car and his young daughter was sitting in the back and she was playing and was driving on the road. And all of a sudden, the cars in front of him stopped. And he couldn't stop. So he put the brake on. As he was stopping, he hit the car in the back and his daughter in the back just came from the back and threw the windshield and she threw out the window. He could not think at that moment. He didn't know what he felt, what broke. He couldn't even think. As he saw and watched her daughter was flying by and through the windshield and tumbling, he just grabbed her and ran to the hospital. And then watching his daughter laying on the bed in the emergency room, he couldn't get in. He only watched her and his daughter through the window. And then he felt how painful it is to watch his daughter laying on bed, bleeding all over the place, not sure whether she's going to survive or not. Watching her was so painful, he couldn't even think how much damage he got in his body. He didn't care about it. Only he felt was watching his daughter 
dying in front of his eyes. It was so painful they could not describe the pain that he had. What is that? Is it a real pain? Who's dying? His daughter was dying. Not him. But it was p- feeling the pain so sharp, so deep. He could not describe the pain that he was having. He couldn't stop crying. Pain. Because that was his daughter. Do you know how painful it is to watch your loved one dying? It's unbearable. You can't stop crying. Their feeling is what you need to feel. Just like what she said, it has to be raw. It cannot be polished. Because the pain is raw and it's real. This is the kind of things that I want to show to you. It's not about going over the same story that you know. The story that I'm going over is nothing new to you guys. You guys already know the story. That's not what I'm going to talk about. What I'm going to talk about is I want you to feel and help you to feel how God feels and how they felt is what I'm helping you to do. And we're going to see more.